Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast, part of the Aston Originals series, providing fresh perspectives from Aston University experts. My name is Robbie Love and I'm a lecturer in English language here at Aston University. I'm a Corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends and variations using uh, large samples of language data. On behalf of the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group, welcome to the show. Now, Corpus Cast is a show all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. In this series, I'm speaking with top researchers in the field to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied to a diverse range of areas. In this episode of Corpus Cast, our topic is how corpus linguistics contributes to research in the area of computational humanities. My guest is Professor Stephanie Avert, Chair of Computational Corpus Linguistics at FAU, uh, Friedrich Alexander University uh, in Germany. Uh, Stephanie has research interests in the methodological foundations of corpus research and digital humanities, including the development of new corpus software and statistical, statistical techniques with applications, especially in the area of corpus-based discourse analysis, among many others. A central goal of Stephanie's research is to develop sound methodological foundations for corpus linguistics, which address key problems in order to ensure that quantitative analyses are both reliable and meaningful. She currently leads a number of funded research projects, one or two of which we'll be discussing today. And before we begin, you may have noticed that I'm in a slightly different setting. That's because I'm currently in Australia on a research trip. Um, and so once again, we're traversing many time zones to make this happen. So um, with great gratitude uh, for being so flexible, uh, thank you very much uh, to Stephanie Avert, my guest today on Corpus Cast. Hello, Stephanie, and welcome. Hi, Robbie. Thanks for having me. And actually, I'm just in Austria on a personal trip. That's why I have a much nicer background than usually. <laughs> oh, yes, I can see. Yes, yes, you're, um, you're currently uh, away from home as well at the moment, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the show. Um, we'll get started then with a couple of questions that I uh, always ask uh, everyone who comes on. Um, what does corpus linguistics mean to you? Well, in a way, it, most of all, it means that I get to make a living doing three things that I enjoy immensely, which are mathematics, computer programming and language, uh, more or less in that order. Uh, but seriously, um, I think that it's not so easy to say what corpus linguistics means to anyone because I believe the field has changed. I've been in corpus linguistics for more than 20 years now. When I entered the field, it was a fairly small, tightly knit community where people were using similar methods, were asking similar questions. And we had these very small and family-like conferences. And by now, I think corpus linguistics has matured into a discipline in its own right which is finding its place in the lens in an interdisciplinary landscape um, and is also developing its own structure of subfields and specializations and so so my understanding I, i've been thinking about this a lot because when i went to conferences um I, I noticed that people were starting to have different perspectives than i have and and i think there were also misunderstandings when people take those different perspectives to research questions especially in the area of uh, corpus linguistic methodology which is as you mentioned is one of my main research interests um i, I believe that the field has diverged into two main streams uh, one of these streams is really concerned with how the human brain essentially concerned it's a con cognitive approach to linguistics and it's concerned with how the human brain processes and learns language um, this stream of corpus linguistics is, is very close to the field of cognitive linguistics and a lot of people, a lot of eminent people like Stefan Gries, Bodo Winter, Birmingham, um, are working in both fields, see themselves both as cognitive linguists and as corpus linguists. And then there's another stream which Michaela Malberg and I have taken to calling applied corpus linguistics um, in order to clarify that um, this is a stream or a line of research that's more focused on how people use language and to what end people use language. So in applied corpus linguistics, we are not so much interested in cognitive reality, but we're interested in asking research questions that have an impact on society 
and that we feel are important to answer and use corpus linguistic methods to get answers to these questions rather than studying language just um, as an end in and of itself. Um, so I'm personally, I'm, I'm very close to applied corpus linguistics, which also overlaps with, uh, which is also very interdisciplinary. I, I think both streams are very interdisciplinary. So the cognitive linguistic stream, of course, overlaps with cognitive science, with psycholinguistics, and also with theoretical linguistics, which has always aimed at understanding how language processing works in the brain. Um, applied corpus linguistics overlaps with the fairly with the, with the very popular fields of digital humanities and computational social science, which is ex actually what we're going to talk about today uh, with the new term computational human humanities that has been emerging in recent times. Um, so uh, this and so so um, I believe that today corpus linguistics can many mean different things to different people and if you ask what it means to me, actually, in the end, it's both things. So I, my heart is fairly close, very close to applied corpus linguistics, which um, has its roots in, in a long British tradition founded by people like J.R. Arthur, who introduced the notion of collocations, John Sinclair, who emphasized the importance of reading concordances and how, many, how much we can learn from reading concordances, and as he put it, trusting the text. Um, and uh, it's natural that I would be very close to this. My PhD thesis was on statistical methods for collocation identification. So this is exactly my line of research and I'm very interested in all the applications that we can do in the humanities and computational social science. But then on the other hand, uh, my methodological research is close to the questions that people are asking in cognitive linguistics. You probably know that uh, cognitive linguists are writing textbooks on statistical methods for corpus linguistics, for corpus analysis. There's a very recent textbook has come out by Bodo Winter. Stefan Gries's textbook is one of the standards in the field. Um, so, so this is close to cognitive linguistics and especially to the approach known as construction grammar, which kind of bridges the two because it treats language as a set of construction. It's actually a, a very corpus linguistic approach. Um, because usage-based theories of language have always been one of the central pillar stones of corpus linguistics, and lots of different theories have been developed over the years. Um, and so I'm, I'm also very interested in applying corpus methods and quantitative methods in such a construction grammar framework. I'm mentioning this because we just got a new research training group, Dimensions of Constructional Space, about to start in October. So I'm not sure when this episode is going to air, if it airs before July 10th, uh, please apply for one of the 13 exciting PhD projects we've got in this group. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud and very happy to be part of that. So I, I think I, I'm trying, as, as always in my life, I'm trying to bridge different things, which also makes life hard, as we're probably going to get <laughs> back to over the course of this interview. Yeah. Well, you're right. Uh, with this this episode, it, we're, we're speaking, of course, in the first week of July. Didn't you know? Uh, this is <laughs> this episode oh, is just uh, at the right time. So do apply. You've just got a few days left before next there's week. Also <laughs> there's also this very exciting postdoc positions, with, which I will have uh, talked about on Twitter by the time you see this episode, um, where you're going to work with me to build um, a research construct you can as a database as a construction database that links to research findings and corpus data. Oh, so brilliant. send in your applications. Fantastic. We're, we're doing lots of time traveling today. It's wonderful. Um, you, you, OK, you, that, that, that was the commercial break. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> um, you, you, you mentioned there, uh, you know, colleagues that you've worked with, but also some some of your, I suppose, academic predecessors or inspirations. You mentioned John Sinclair, for instance. Um, so it leads me to ask, you know, how did you get started in corpus linguistics? Well, uh, so I think actually I, I got started in corpus linguistics by just following my interests, um, mm -hmm. although it wasn't really in a very straight line. So um, as you've probably read on my web page, I started off doing a master level degree in mathematics, a German diploma. Um, I spent a lot of time in front of the computer during that time. 
And then also I took up studying in English as a, as a secondary subject, just to stay in practice. I mean, how, how I fell in love with the English language in the first place, that, that's another anecdote, and I'm sure we have time for that. Uh, but go do on. come back to that if you want. <laughs> Tell the anecdote or go on. Oh, yeah, no, tell, tell the anecdote. Yeah, this is great. We love stories. Yeah, this is a funny story. Um, so I really wasn't interested in language at all. Um, I was more, more a maths person and I was from the start I was interested in technology, computers, mathematics, science fiction, novels. Um, I was good in maths and computers. Well, we didn't have computers at the time, maths, but not maths and natural sciences in school. Um, and I was also doing okay in languages, but sort of I, I never... I never reconnected with, say, we, we took up English as a first foreign language, um, and I, I never really connected with that. And then it was actually our family physician who decided they had to send their son to England to language school, so he would have better chances of uh, making good career later in life. But they didn't want to send him on his own because he was 12 or 13 years old at the time. So they convinced my, my parents that it's very important for me to go there too. So I, I spent the summer in a language school in Eastbourne uh, and it turned out I enjoyed this, it so much. Um, I enjoyed learning English there, I enjoyed, I enjoyed being in England, I just enjoyed everything there, that I pestered my parents to keep sending me back there. So basically every summer I would spend two or three or four weeks in this language school. And I really fell in love with the English language there and, and also with reading literature, which I hadn't understood at all before. And so uh, that's how in the end, I, I loved both language and became interested in linguistics while my main strength and interest was still, or love, my biggest love was still mathematics and computers. Okay, so that, that put us on a sidetrack. <laughs> All those summers in Eastbourne, lucky thing. Uh, <laughs> nothing against Eastbourne, of course. <laughs> Thousands of foreign students. You could actually tell them the, the, the time of year by which students were there. So you get oh. one week, you get all the French students, and two weeks later, you get all the German students. You could exactly tell what time of year it is. So that, you know, the, 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 the interest both in maths and also language, you know, inevitably would lead you towards a computational corpus linguistics route. I guess that's that's what happened for you eventually. Yeah. So so what happened, what happened first is that at some point I found out there's a field called computational linguistics, which combines exactly or which needs exactly the combinations of interests that I had. Mm -hmm. um, so I managed to get myself a student job, a student re a job as a student research assistant at the Institute for Natural Language Processing. So computational linguistics and natural language processing are used interchangeably uh, in the English community. Um, so I got a job at the Institute for Natural Language Processing at the University of Stuttgart, where I was studying at the time. Um, then I, I, it was so interesting that I didn't finish my English degree, but instead focused on getting in, in there. Um, they soon offered me to do a PhD with them, and that's what I did. And over time, I'm... Uh, during this time, I started working with actual linguists um, and linguistic research. So I was doing more the methodological aspects, but I found that this is um, even closer to what uh, what I like to do than computational linguistics. Um, so moving from maths into computational linguistics was already, I, I've got more anecdotes there, funny anecdotes. Moving from maths into computational linguistics also was a was good because for the first time I felt I was doing something that, that has an application that matters to people. Mm -hmm. So mathematics is quite abstract. My diploma thesis was an analysis of the low frequency asymptotics of solutions to the Helmholtz equations in exterior domains under electric and magnetic boundary conditions. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I made a, I have a crib sheet which has the title because um, <laughs> I occasionally yeah, peek into my diploma thesis. And for the first five years or so, I still understood what I did back then, but now it's sort of, I would have to spend quite some time to get back into all the mathematics. Well, what if you remember is- Lost me, so you, you did a lot better than me. <laughs> what, what I do remember though, is that uh, I actually found a very nice solution in the end. And I was really happy at the time about this, it was really interesting mathematics, but it turns out 
Uh, so, so Helmholtz equations describe electromagnetic waves. So it's really electromagnetic waves that hit some finite bodies mm. and the, in, an, in a large space, that's the exterior domain. So I, I, I had also moved into this because it's more applied than very theoretical aspects of mathematics. Uh, but then it turns out that those solutions that I was looking at are formally uh, are sort of mathematically possible, but never occurs actual electromagnetic waves. So I, I was studying something that doesn't really exist. Ah. And then I moved into computational linguistics. And one of the first things I did was to compile a large German word list for an electronic version of, Scra of the Scrabble game. And that was so cool. And then <laughs> I could actually go to a shop and buy the Scrabble game that I'd been, I had worked on. Uh, wow, uh, that's amazing. Um, yeah, well, it's and it for me it was really amazing that going from this really theoretical world of mathematics that nobody outside really seemed to care about to doing things that that people use and that people are interested in uh, was so much fun. Yeah, and then um, and so I really got in touch with corpus linguistics. That sounds like uh, like a, um, an academic joke. It's actually, I, I met a corpus linguist in a bar. And we ended up spending the evening running down Chomsky and I thought, well, I think I like those people. Um, the, the corpus linguist, by the way, was Hans Martin Lehmann, one of the developers of BNC Web, so, which was ah. also very influential. And sort of, and then we had this shared interest in programming, in mathematical, in sort of quantitative analysis. And he really convinced me that corpus linguistics is sort of a cool place to be. It's a fun place to be. And, and then I realized that, uh, do you have to, did you ask when it was? When, yeah, when, when did you have that meeting? Um, do I have to tell you, it makes me, it makes me feel so old. That was, <laughs> no. back in 19, that was back in 1998 on my very first business trip at the university. Brilliant. Uh, a meeting in Bergen, in Norway. Well, and and but then I found out that there's more to it than that because uh, sort of natural language processing as a field is uh, very much oriented towards computer science, and so there is it, it treats everything as a machine learning problem and as or as a computational task. And the goal, the main goal, is to develop better computational tools. So it's all about evaluating stuff, improving accuracy and competing between competitions between different teams and mm -hmm. but i've always been much more interested in not and un, not developing not just developing better algorithms or faster algorithms but understanding why certain things work and why other things do. why does a certain formula give me a, a good list of collocations and another formula doesn't and that's exactly what corpus linguistics does so corpus linguistics is about interpretation and understanding and that's why it's the discipline I felt at home. I, I felt most at home in. But but as you can, as you've already seen from from the title of my chair, which I managed to after several years at Erlang, I managed to change the title of my chair to computational corpus linguistics because again I I'm trying to bridge fields and so tend to be sitting between chairs if that works in English. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I think that straddling the disciplines and combining computational linguistics with corpus linguistics. And I, th I think that's um, that's really interesting. It ties in with what you said at the beginning about, you know, corpus linguistics even kind of dividing into these two groups and, and maybe, you know, most researchers are kind of one or the other, but you're even within corpus linguistics straddling kind of two groups and then corpus linguistics and computational linguistics. But then, of course, we get into the humanities, and you you mentioned the term computational humanities, which is what we've named this this episode. Um, that there might be some people who who you know sort of go, okay, corpus linguistics, it's linguistics, linguistics. Maybe we call it a social science, and that's kind of a different thing. I'm, for instance, in a, the school of social sciences and humanities at Aston University. It's considered as two separate categories, right? So what is it about corpus linguistics that contributes to the humanities? How, how can corpus linguistics help with the interpretation of the sort of data that uh, researchers in the humanities work with? 
I, I think that what corpus linguistics really can give to the humanities and the social sciences. So it's in Germany, we also have this, that the humanities and social sciences are two, seen as two separate fields. Um, and um, social scientists are always very cross if they get subsumed under the umbrella of digital humanities or somebody tries <laughs> that. Um, so I think what, what Corpus Linguistics con can contribute lies in its overlap, and that's especially the, the side of applied Corpus Linguistics, uh, lies in its overlap with the humanities and computational social science. Mm. Yeah. And this, there's this overlap both res with respect to the research questions, but also with respect to the approaches and methods used. So, so in the humanities, the, so shared topics uh, with digital humanities would be stuff like literary stylometry, understanding the style of an author, authorship attribution based on stylometric features, um, understanding evaluative language, how we talk about music or art. Um, and then of course, all the work in historical studies, sort of making sense of what certain textual records can tell us about the past. And uh, at a more sort of you know, at a more synchronic level, we have a lot of overlap with work done in computational social studies, especially what we do in discourse, corpus assisted discourse studies, where we start to study social cultural discourses, um, especially with respect to power relations. Uh, we can look at political argumentation, and then of course all the research and social networks. It, basically, everywhere that the humanities, computational science, computational social science deals with language data there's overlap with what we're doing corpus linguistics. Um, but sort of the, the reason why corpus linguistics, why I believe corpus linguistics is important to the humanities is that I, I, I feel that in humanities and social science, that there's this sharp divide between qualitative and quantitative research, mm. which doesn't mean you do either one or the other. Most people, nowadays will combine both approaches, but they'll combine them in the sense of a triangulation. So we do a quantitative analysis, some fancy network visualization, and then we'll do a qualitative analysis of a few selected texts, mm. or a few selected authors, mm. and then combine the findings from these into the interpretation so that they, they both fit into the interpretation. Um, in, in the digital humanities, uh, this is often expressed as a dichotomy of uh, close reading versus distant reading. I think, I'm, I'm not sure, was it Ted Underwood who came up with those terms, but it doesn't really matter because they've been picked up by the field and, and it's sort of a justification for what, so close reading means that you actually read a text in detail, typically applied to literary texts, and distant reading is taken to mean that you just perform a quantitative analysis and you look at typically then large collections of text from a distance and sort of only compare their general shapes brought out by the quantitative mm -hmm. analysis. And, and I think this sort of the, this metaphor, it's, this metaphor has been used to justify the purely quantitative as, approach as a form of distant reading as a complement to the close reading. Mm -hmm. uh, but I see a lot of problems with that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of excellent work in the humanities um, but there's a tendency to just perform some analysis, visualize the results, and then find an interpretation for what you see there. And interpreting quantitative analysis is extremely difficult in my opinion, so especially if, you, if it's based on visualization. Um, many of the aesthetic qualities of the visualization can influence your interpretation. And quite often I've found people, researchers will just try to, well, if you, if you're a humanities person who has thorough knowledge of the of a certain topic and he has their research questions, and then you a computer scientist comes with this fancy network visualization, you just try to pick out something there, and then you might spot something that sort of resonates with what you know about the topic, mm -hmm. and then you'll try to construct a narrative around it. So again, it's it's really it's always about discourses and narratives. Um, and ignore all the other patterns brought out by the analysis. Mm -hmm. So in order to really understand interpret analysis, you would have to understand exactly what the mathematical, the underlying mathematical methods do, and what certain visual patterns you get from that actually mean. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get the same with topic analysis, uh, with topic modeling, 
or my absolute pet peeve of word clouds. So word clouds are the worst idea that the humanities ever had, but <laughs> everybody puts them everywhere because they, they just look nice, uh, but they go against all principles of visualization. What's so bad about them? Okay, the, the, the problem is the problem is how people do word clouds. So okay. um, if you know anything about visualization theory, uh, the basic idea behind visualize, so the theoretical approach to, visual, to, to data visualization or information visualization says, well, we have data sets which consist of some objects that have certain properties, and we have certain visual variables that we can use in the visualization, such as text size, color, shapes, mm -hmm. um, position, patterns, angle, and etc. Mm -hmm. um, and visualization formally is a mapping from uh, properties of the object to visual variables. And if you look at what what the especially the most popular the uh, word clouds that people first produce do is, well, they just take a list of keywords in in the best case, mm. quite often just a list of most frequent words or most frequent hashtags from the analysis. And then they use an algorithm that just arrange and then sort of they use one meaningful variable, which is the size, which is text size that mm. somehow corresponds to frequency or some measure mm. of keyness. Um, and then they use an algorithm to arrange those words. Um, this algorithm assigns other variables, it assigns color, it assigns orientation and it assigns position mm. uh, without any meaning, without any relation to actual data, just so that it gets uh, aesthetic visualizations and color is yeah. usually, colors even are usually assigned randomly. And then of course, naturally as humans, we interpret this word cloud to mean that words that are close to each other have some connection, either they're semantically mm. similar or are related in some other way. Mm. We will also, it will be easy to read words that are in horizontal orientation rather than vertical orientation. Um, we might think that different colors mean different things, different orientations mean different things and so on. So, so it's the worst possible thing. It suggests there is information and structure where there's none at all. Of course, we have a better version of word clouds, but I think we can talk about that later. <laughs> so word clouds are even worse than uh, pie charts, would you say? That they're equally bad? Oh, definitely. Or? Definitely. <laughs> so I, I know a lot of uh, a lot of corpus linguists really don't like uh, pie charts for similar reasons. <laughs> um, yes, the, the, I, I know the criticism in, but but sort of in this case, it's just sort of one problem. Word clouds yes. have a problem. So let's let's talk about how you're applying uh, some of these ideas and bringing together corpus linguistics and the humanities and computational linguistics. Uh, one of the projects that you're leading at the moment is um, responding, I suppose, of course, to the, the COVID pandemic that's been going on for several years now. And it's called Tracking the Infodemic Conspiracy Theories in the Corona Crisis. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what we've been uh, exploring here and, and, and how these the synergy between these two disciplines has helped you to do this research. Of course, I'm not doing this project on my own, like mm. almost all the projects I do, it's an interdisciplinary collaboration, in this case with Fabian Schäfer, Professor of Japanese Studies at, at my university, um, who's been working not so much on conspiracy theories, but uh, on right-wing populism for several years and social media activism. Mm. Um, so he's an expert on the field of such discourses and also has moved into work on uh, conspiracy theories, uh, whereas I am more focused on the technical and methodological aspects, issues of this project. So I, I hadn't really given much thought to conspiracy theories. I had always assumed that it's something that just a few crackpots would could possibly <laughs> believe in, because sort of at least the ones you, you saw on TV were are so absurd, all the stuff about 5G, mm. what was it, mind control via 5G, and that Bill, Bill Gates is behind everything. Mm. It seemed just absurd to me. And mm. and then on, on TV, you would also see clearly crackpot people advancing these or believing these conspiracy theories. So, so I hadn't given much thought to this until we had the opp opportunity to apply, uh, to make a bid for a funded project um, after the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. Um, so in this case, this is funded by the Volkswagen Foundation, 
uh, who offered to fund project that somehow helped us get over the pandemic. And it was nice that they were that they didn't focus on medical social aspects, but that they were open to any kind of research that can contribute to helping us in this pandemic. Um, so that's why I started looking at conspiracy theories more earnestly. And I was absolutely shocked to learn that um, more than a, almost a third of all Germans believe some kind of conspiracy theory. So there, mm. there was one opinion poll where they asked something like, do you believe that secret powers are controlling some aspects of the world? Mm. And I think it was 30% of all respondents said yes. Right. Um, um, which was something I wouldn't really have expected. But then, of course, what we saw in the news just confirmed this information that in the COVID pandemic, conspiracy theories seem to spread beyond, I think they were more in, in their own bubble of people mm. who influenced each other, got each other believing these, but then suddenly they seem to spread out and we got all these, probably heard about all the mass demonstrations we had in Germany. There was this weirding movement that managed to mobilize very large scale demonstrations, tens of thousands of people at a time when uh, people weren't allowed to go outside and to have those meetings. Mm. And then they also teamed up with right-wing populism, the Neue Rechte, which I think is similar to the alt-right movement in the US. Mm. Um, and, 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 and would even attack state institutions. There was this famous um, attack on the German, an attempt to occupy the German parliament in, what was it, uh, August 2020. Um, which really drove it home how, what, how much impact these conspiracy theories can have. And especially the Querdenken Queer movement, which started in Stuttgart, so sort of the area I grew up in, but then spread across all of Germany, seemed to attract a lot of people that we would normally have expected to be more reasonable. And mm -hmm. there were also many doctors, physicians, and um, scientists involved in this movement, and so somehow they managed to um, they, they managed to connect to find a connection that drew people into believing these conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. and that's often done via some intermediate some claims that are less implausible than the sort of the hardcore conspiracy theories, um, and somehow this seems to sort of open up get people to, if, if you give people something, and especially people who are affected by, I think what happened was that the COVID pandemic put a lot of stress on people. There was economic hardship there. Mm. Uh, before, even before COVID, we had a refugee crisis when we got those uh, lots of refugees from Syria and Germany, and, and then the COVID pandemic. And uh, this is a, at, at such a time of high uncertainty um, and, and a lot of, social, psychological, and economic pressure, mm -hmm. um, people were more prone to believing simple explanations, certain explanations for why they were having such a hard time. And somehow that seemed to draw them into this entire system of conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. um, right, and to get to our actual research project, so um, the project tracking the infodemic starts from two observations. One is that um, social media have played a very important role in spreading conspiracy theories, especially uh, during the time of the COVID pandemic. And it's not just because people didn't get out. Um, it's just that uh, via the various, so there was um, the, the spread of these conspiracy theories was strongly driven by a number of influences on various social media channels. Mm. They have their own websites, uh, YouTube, Telegram, to a certain degree, also Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and the other observation was that um, conspiracy theories work by forming a complex network. So um, there's not just a single conspiracy theory like the corona, uh, the COVID pandemic has been is sort of an invention, it's not as dangerous as it seems, mm -hmm. but it's really a set of lots of individual mini theories that connect into a network and, 
a network that once you start believing the premises of the conspiracy theorists is actually logically consistent mm. and sort of my interpretation or my assumption is that that's how people are drawn in if you start believing some of these because they'll have some theories that are or some claims that are um, easier to digest or easier to swallow um, and then you get all these other claims that somehow connect up to these and start making sense if you just look at them in their own logic um, that seems to draw people into this uh, this is also that this by the way also explains why we get this uh, why there's overlap between the uh, covid related conspiracy theories and right-wing populism mm. uh, the right-wing populists also try to capitalize on any other on other movements to make their um their claims and their theories more palatable to a general public to make mm. them a more wide um, a wider mainstream acceptance um, and if you also capitalize on all the conspiracy theories around covid uh, by connecting them to the right-wing conspiracy theories um, and these two aspects that it's actually the affair the, 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 the fairly huge amounts of text published on social media networks and mm. and this network character of uh, the conspiracy theories uh, that's why i felt a corpus linguistic approach will help us uh, get a better understanding of those um, so you went and you gathered posts from different uh social yeah, media platforms. Yeah. Um, actually, we spend um, a large part of the time so far finding suitable data sets. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, our, our sort of our main platform, our main platforms for a large samples for a large sample study where we want to really see how these conspiracy theories spread, mm -hmm. uh, will be Twitter and Reddit, which mm -hmm. is actually a fairly poor choice because in the German speaking world, Twitter is relatively unimportant. Twitter is ne never a good sample of the population. It's, it's not really a digital social scope. Uh, Twitter isn't also, also isn't the place where most of these conspiracy theories are spread. It, it used to be much more a place for conspiracy theories, but when they started clamping down on fake news and um, actually shutting down accounts, uh, people moved on to different platforms. Yeah. And as I said, in the German speaking world, especially, it's it has much less impact than uh, internationally. I think the, the the biggest languages in Twitter are English and Japanese, actually. So it's very uh -huh. big in Japan. But in Germany, people have been uh, always been much more drawn to Facebook than Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. Much more, many more people are on Facebook than on Twitter. Uh, but the problem is none of these media platforms allows researchers to actually use the data and work with the data. Yeah. Um, and that's why we always end up working with Twitter because they are very open towards research and uh, they this enables us to actually carry out large scale studies and, and also large uh, fully legal studies where we don't like that like happen sometimes on Facebook, don't just buy data and abuse them for purposes there uh, without the permissions and without um, mm asking permissions from the original authors, where on Twitter, we have clear agreements with the Twitter company, with the mother company. Um, and also we're only using data that has been published, that's available for everyone to see on the web. Um, yeah. So there are, there are far less privacy and personality right issues uh, than other platforms. So that's why we still work with Twitter, but actually in order to identify the conspiracy fears in the first place, we had to turn to other social media platforms so we've been following, um, so we, we picked a set of people, uh, conspiracy theor theorists uh, who are very influential, who are known to be influential, and followed, downloaded their YouTube videos, looked at the, YouTube, the comments to these videos, and especially looked for their Telegram channels and some other related Telegram channels. And we've collected a corpus of a size that I could tell you if you need to, but uh, it'll take me a minute to look up the particular <laughs> It's over 100 million words now, so you get a lot of data from, from Telegram. Um, but the idea is to sort of use these channels where we can just follow individual people with individual influences to identify uh, the specific conspiracy theories or the most important conspiracy theories around COVID and 
the individual narratives that are built around these conspiracy theories. So it's perhaps better to talk about narratives than sub theories. Um, mm -hmm. So we have all these different narratives that work together to build a conspiracy theory. Um, and then we want to find these narratives in the large sum, in the large Twitter and Reddit samples, mm. where we can actually see how they're picked up by different people and how they spread across the network. Mm. So you can you can actually sort of track the development of a particular, as you say, narrative or, or a set of narratives that contribute that form together That's, to make a conspiracy theory. I have to say that's the plan. So yeah. that, that's what we want to get to. We still have yeah. until the end of September. Um, at the moment, we're working actually identifying these conspiracy mm -hmm. theories, which is also an inter interesting problem. Um, and again, a reason why I think it's also a good example of how corpus linguistics actually helps to sort to address these uh, mm -hmm. tasks. Uh, so of course, conspiracy theories, fake news have become a massive problem over the last years, which got natural language processing interested and it's a much bigger and much better funded field than corpus linguistics. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of research that tries to identify fake news, automatically detect fake news or distinguish when identify conspiracy theories. Um, and as always people, um, as most of the time in natural language processing, people just treat this as a machine learning problem, as a classification problem. So you've got a collection of say tweets and each tweet has to be assigned to a certain category, which could be mm -hmm. conspiracy or not a conspiracy theory or fake news, or real news, etc. Um, this works by, in order to train a machine learning system to recognize these categories, what you have to do is first you need a predefined inventory of categories, and then you need to manually annotate training data. Uh, typically a few thousand tweets will, will be needed at least to train a good machine learning system, mm -hmm. which is a tedious process and it's even harder if you don't know in advance, in advance what the conspiracy th conspiracy theories are, um, and and I think that's sort of that's that's where corpus linguistics comes in because in order to identify the conspiracy theories, we have to carry out a corpus study of what we got from telegrams and by actually doing keyword analysis in telegram and then looking at examples concordances for those keywords, we identified a set of cons frequent conspiracy theories in, around COVID and also lots of individual sub-narratives. Mm. Uh, there was the purely corpus linguistic analysis and we want to use those insights now to build classifiers that can automatically identify these. And in contrast to much of the work in natural language processing, uh, we don't, the goal is not just to identify whether it's a conspiracy theory or not, but rather identify specific sub-narratives. Mm. And then that's because we believe that conspiracy theories work because there's such a network of connected sub-narratives. So if, you, if, if your goal is not just to block every conspiracy theory, and we've seen that it doesn't work. If Twitter mm. blocks conspiracy theories, they'll just move to Telegram. If Telegram yeah. does it, move to some other platform, or like Trump will try to build their own social media platform. Yeah. So I think, and effective countermeasures will have to argue against the conspiracy theories. And we can only do that if we understand the, narr the sub-narratives and we can actually tar give targeted responses to the sub-narratives. Mm. So the goal is really, our goal is really to identify the specific sub-narratives and track their spread on Twitter and not just the conspiracy theory as a whole. Um, and that's we've got some very encouraging results here is in what's known as zero-shot learning or zero-shot classification. Um, the basic idea is that you use some kind of deep learning system. Everybody knows is artificial in artificial intelligence these days. Um, a deep learning system that's been trained on huge amounts of text in a completely unsupervised fashion to identify similarities, semantic similarities between sentences. And so what we do is we, our categories are the narrative. Mm -hmm but they are actually short descriptions of short summaries of the narratives. And by comparing tweets to summaries of the narratives, we can do a classification based purely on similarity, semantic similarity between the description of the narrative and the actual text. And mm. our first experiments, this has worked surprisingly well. Uh, we are far from getting an accuracy that would be sufficient for an automatic mm. identification, 
but the results we're getting are encouraging that they'll help us build a large sample of such narratives or corpus of such narratives from Twitter. Mm. So that um, and I think that that also shows how corpus linguistics can help us. This corpus linguistics which can help us carry over research new methods from computational linguistics into the humanities without forcing the humanities to do things the way that computational linguistics does and without having uh, yeah. to treat everything as a classification problem with clear cut categories. Mm -hmm. So it, this is really interesting. You, in terms of you know applied corpus linguistics, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, you said that the, the goal with, with this particular project is to kind of have targeted, or one of the goals is to have targeted responses. So do, do you mean, how, how would that, in terms of the, the vision, you know, how, how might that actually look? Is it a similar kind of thing as to what uh, Twitter brought in, I think a couple of years ago now, to combat, uh, to try to combat disinformation, a, a message popping up if you share a link that you haven't actually opened to say, do you want to read the yeah, article? Which I find is a very, a very that's useful, a very good idea. Is that what you mean by a targeted response where an automated account would come in and say, that sounds like uh, a conspiracy theory. Maybe you shouldn't trust that source. You shouldn't trust what they say. Is that is that the kind of idea? Yes, I, I'm rather, uh, we haven't really discussed, so we, we've seen it as a potential. Uh, we also applied for another project that was turned down, unfortunately, where we had a, a partner in the team who have worked on actually counter developing countermeasures or, mm. uh, actually more kind of counter narrative what what we had in mind is more kind of counter narrative so uh, basically right. if you if you look at the hard hardcore believers of conspiracy theories i i think it'll be impossible to stop those from them from believing in those yeah. they're, they're, they're so deeply in that but uh we saw that people got drawn people we felt are completely ordinary and sensible people mm -hmm. were getting drawn into this network of conspiracy theories and were getting in deeper and deeper and we felt that at this stage um you could probably stop them from believing all these conspiracy theories if you provided the right counter arguments if you counted all the narratives so once if you know the narratives and can counter them by evidence or by sort of kind of an anti-narrative sounds wrong to me because sort of it, it will be based on an actual fact and just explain the facts and explain why this doesn't make sense uh, and, and targeted countermeasures in that sense. And then, of course, we could have something like automated accounts that react to these. Mm. Uh, I mean, if I can digress a little bit, my personal Twitter feed is very much dominated by uh, the trans community these days, mm -hmm. and especially by um, all the transphobic um, attacks we're getting from the gender, uh, what was it, gender critical movement and other movements mm -hmm. and sort of uh, what, what these those people do and it's exactly the same what we see with the right-wing populism and conspiracy theorists and Donald Trump and, and all those other uh, all these other forms of populism they just keep repeating their arguments and it's often the same and then uh, when you watch these videos of influences of, of, of conspiracy theories they mm -hmm. just jump from one narrative to another and just run through them at an amazing speed. So you don't even have time to really react and think about it. And uh, on Twitter, it's very difficult. Basically, you could spend all day uh, just posting counter arguments against claims that are made, against often um, incorrect claims that are made. But people, if you, if you have enough people making those claims all the time, it just drowns all in, on any counter -mist. And of course, um, identifying narratives, such narratives automatically, we could identify those tweets and then have automated accounts actually post responses, mm. um, sort of to balance out this. Um, the responses would be designed by humans to actually give the right answer to that, but the tedious work of responding over and over again to the same arguments being made, that could be automated. So that's sort of kind of is my vision why, why I feel it's necessary. That's 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 really interesting, and and yes, you know, there are parallels, as you say, uh, from from what you're finding the the argumentation strategies, if you will, of of several groups who are you know arguing for uh, something that is um, I'm not sure what the word is, maybe 
controversial uh, or, or they, they see it as being controversial. And, you know, um, it's, uh, it's, it's really fascinating. I think as um, we could, I mean, there's so much more that, that my goodness, there's so much more we, we could be talking about as well. I know you've done work on Brexit, for instance, which um, sounds, you know, really interesting as well as, as a Brit. Um, but I wanna, I wanna start to, to wrap it up in, in, in the interests of time. Um, and we, we end with uh, quick questions, and I always make the same joke, it's probably getting boring now, but they're quick questions, but they might not have quick answers, we'll see. I think you actually have kind of touched upon some I of these. I think you should have given up the hope of me giving quick answers by now. <laughs> I, I know you were worried you wouldn't have enough to say to fill an episode. Look at this, we've, 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 it's, it's flown by, it's amazing. Um, Let's let's we'll, we'll give this a go. See how see how we do. And you've already mentioned a big change, actually. So there may not be others that you notice. But what what is or are the biggest change or changes that you've noticed in uh, corpus linguistics throughout your career? Yeah, I think it's actually actually exactly what I talked about. That that when I got into corpus linguistics, I, when I went to my first ICAM conference, there were. 40 or 50 people. It was this small group of people who knew each other. It was more like a bit of a holiday meeting friends than a <laughs> scientific conference yeah. uh, where people present their work and attack each other's work and what whatnot. Yeah. Um, and this has changed completely. Now the Corpus Linguistics Conference regularly have hundreds of attendants. I remember going to the first Corpus Linguistics Conference at uh, Lancaster University in 2001. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first relatively large gathering of corpus linguists now it seemed huge at the time but now we regularly get 300 or more people at a corpus linguistics conference it's really grown into a much bigger field mm -hmm. and and that means that that we're really diverging and uh, i think that's also changed because at, when i started people as i mentioned i felt people were using the same methods everybody is doing collocation analysis keywords concordancing yeah. um and then uh, and, and they were also they also had similar research interests and similar research questions. So yeah. you would just understand each other and you could just chat about these and would understand why people do things the way they do things. Mm -hmm. And now we've got these very different perspectives that people come from cognitive linguistics background, they treat quantitative analysis more or less like studying experimental data, analyzing experimental data. So they have these huge uh, mixed effects regression models. Mm -hmm. But and they feel that if you do things Sort of the old-fashioned way with a standard collocation analysis that's not right because you have to you have to have these regression models for the kind of questions they have they are just the right models and i fully agree with that uh, but applied corpus linguistics has different questions and mm. um that's actually um one of my main interests what, what i really want to do see i can't just give a short answer <laughs> <laughs> i just get too excited about that uh, actually develop the methodology of applied corpus linguistics uh, mm. to support the goals of applied corpus linguistics, which will have different requirements. I was hoping that uh, because we've got a lot of papers now on methodology, mm. but it turns out they're all in this cognitive linguistics paradigm, and there's only so much we can learn for applied corpus linguistics from there. I see, I see. So. Um... We'll, we'll return to that in the final, the third and final question. But my second question, my second quick question is, what is the biggest misconception of corpus linguistics that you've encountered? That, that's a simple one. That's a short one. Uh, it's obviously that some people think I'm working on body language. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If they know a little bit of Latin, they translate corpus linguistics in the body. It keeps happening to me and in Germany. Um, actually, one person in our university administration keeps sending letters addressed to the chair of body linguistics. That's Körper linguistics in <laughs> Körper linguistic in German. So it's really nice, close to corpus linguistics. I so, haven't corrected them yet because it makes for such a nice opener to any introduction to corpus linguistics. It's 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 interesting that you know this comes up a lot when when we're especially teaching you know undergraduates who've never heard of corpus linguistics before for the first time, it, it always comes up as this sort of, oh, it's not body like, oh, do, do you think that, and, you know, obviously this is the name, you know, that, that the field has, has, has kind of come to, to, to take on, but do you think if, if it were possible to go back 
you know decades and sort of the the earlier developments of the field would there be a better could there be a, a better more appropriate name for for what it is ultimately we're doing chucking texts together and looking at the patterns and the frequency data in using software etc than corpus linguistics which is you know as you say misleading do you have any thoughts on that i well I, I i never asked myself that question i, I really I, like the name corpus linguistics i like it too but i also appreciate that it's you know it's not it's it's not as descriptive as or as, as relevant as it could be but then the alternatives you start to end up going down the kind of big data route and then it starts to get you know, I think the best strategy is just to make the field better known and larger and more popular because uh, we had the same with computational linguistics. So mm -hmm. a few years ago, people wouldn't really know either what computational linguistics mean. They'd rather guess it has something to do with computers and language, so that's closer to the mark. But they also felt, uh, I've no idea what, what actually what you do if you do computational linguistics. But nowadays, it's becoming a bit of a household term, or at least that... Um, grammar school student mm. students will know will have heard about because mm. of you know all this ai they know that that's that the, what the people at google do to produce automatic translations and all that and so i think that's probably the better strategy just work so well make an impact on the world and everybody will know what the purpose is which leads very nicely to the last question which is how will in your opinion, corpus linguistics make an impact on the world in the future? Well, I, what I believe and what I hope is that corpus linguistics will make this indirect impact in the world via the humanities and computation social science, that mm -hmm. by helping those fields bring actually bring to their the qualitative and quantitative approaches, um, give them the tools to integrate the two perspectives, go from a quantitative pattern to the actual data, like any corpus linguistic tool, CQP web, um, Antcong, sketch engine, it will allow you to click on things and go to the actual concordance lines. Mm -hmm. And I believe one central building block there is, um, is the concordance. That's the method, that's the technique in corpus linguistics that really integrates both perspectives and I think by developing concordancing, developing te better techniques for reading concordances and for organizing concordances. Mm. Uh, that's where how we can really bring corpus linguistics in the future, apply CL in the future, into the future and make a huge difference. Mm. I look forward to, uh, to, to reading and hearing more about that. Um, and uh, We'll we'll wrap we'll wrap things up here. There, there was so much more that we we could have talked about, but this has been this has been really nice. I think this is a really a really nice uh, way to, to to finish things. Um, so I, I will of course thank you, uh, Stephanie, for for joining us. It's been brilliant. It's been lovely to speak to you, um, and thank you for watching or listening uh, Corpus Cast, whether that's on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, or Podchaser. Do let us know your thoughts about this and other episodes in the series using the hashtag CorpusCast and make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus. CorpusCast is an Aston Originals podcast written and hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. So thank you for listening. And thanks uh, once again to Stephanie Ava. It's been a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, everybody.